This lesson is on payments in the Uniform Accounting Network. Please turn to the New Client Handbook, page 55. The menu path to payments is Accounting Transactions Payments. So in our software, we go to Accounting Transactions Payments. It opens up the Payments area. And if you click on the Add button, you'll see there's three types of payment, warrant, manual, or electronic. If we look back at our book. Well, in the overview, we have a payment is an expenditure of money to a vendor. Well, we all know that. The amount of the payment is distributed among one or more appropriation count codes. We'll see that. So. You have to admit, have a minimum of one account code you're going to be charging when you make a payment. And then, then there are three types of payments. Number one, a warrant payment. Well, if you make a payment like that, it's going to print, it's going to expect that you put a warrant into the printer and it's going to print to one of your warrants from your primary checking account. The second bullet point is manual payments. This is used to enter information from handwritten warrants. So again, as I mentioned with investment and investment transfer lesson, it's um, just my personal opinion. I would avoid doing these as much write, handwriting warrants as much as possible because you can um, easily, even experienced fiscal officers can easily get their warrants out of sequence, their handwritten warrants out of sequence with what you've been recorded, what you recorded in UAN if you're not very careful. And of course you can fix that, but fixing it, um, you know, it's always easy, easier to do it uh, correctly than fixing something. So um, if at all possible, if you're going to print a, use a warrant, print, use the warrant option, and then on rare occasions, the manual warrant. And then lastly, electronic. This is used to print vouchers for payments not entailing a warrant, such as an online payment online payments or bank service charges. And there's a note, the UAN software does not originate the electronic payments, but this payment type can be used to enter the information from such payments already made using electronic or online payment services. So in other words, if you're paying, let's say with your insurance company, they say, well, you can make your payment online. Um, and you know, you don't have to send us a check, just we've got an online service. Well, you'll use their service. That's not part of UAN. We haven't int integrated that with UAN. So you use their service, but you have to record it in your accounting system. And you don't want to print a warrant or record a warrant here. So that's why we have the electronic payment option. That would also apply to, you know, like I said, bank service charges. Maybe you ordered some direct, um, a uh, new set of checks or deposit tickets and they charge you a, a fee for that. Well, they're not going, not going to send you a bill to have you write a check from the bank account. They're just going to charge, it's going to come off the top, off the bank account itself as an electronic uh, charge. So you would re record it that way in UAN. All right, a few highlights. You can backdate a manual warrant or an electronic payment back to the last bank reconciliation date. So these two types you can backdate, manual or electronic. Now I mentioned that um, or an, example to, an example use for this would be if the manual warrant was written uh, but not added to the UN, the UN system until the next calendar day. So you, you wrote a check to someone or to some um, company, and then you came in the next day and recorded the manual warrant. Well, it would make sense. You actually, the check date was actually the day before, so that makes sense for you to backdate that manual payment. Or another example, the, those bank service charges. You get your bank statement, you see, okay, uh, they charged me 1150 for those deposit tickets. You might not know the exact amount when you order the tickets, so you find out later and you can backdate that expense to the date it was actually re reduced your cash balance at the bank. Those are two acceptable reasons for um, 
record backdating a payment. However, um, the system does not allow you to backdate printed warrant payments. And the reason for this should be obvious. Um, if the, today is the September 1st and the UN system, when I use this option, it's going to print to my printer. So I'm recording a, a payment. It's going to print a warrant that I can send to someone and they can cash it and, and, and uh, you know, get their money. Well, it doesn't make sense that we're going to allow you to date that check as of last week. Okay, so there is no backdating of printed warrants. Now, if you hand wrote a check last week and you're just now recording it in the UAN system, then that would be a manual warrant and that would make sense. You could, we would allow you to backdate that that warrant payment. You can forward date as well. Um, you have the ability to forward date up to 30 days in advance, just like with receipts, from the calendar date that it's posted. We can click that post print button. Forward date, however, just like with receipts and every other type of cash transaction, if you forward date the payment, it will post to cash immediately. In other words, it'll increase or decrease your cash balances immediately. So <laughs> <coughs> so, excuse me. So, one reason you might forward date is, well, maybe um, it's the weekend, it's Friday, and you want to send out some payments early Monday morning. Um, you can date those checks Monday morning on when you're at Friday afternoon. You're recording your payments. You can date them Monday morning. Um, you have to make sure you don't mail them early. You don't want to. You want don't want to forward date that way. But you can forward date it so it'll print mon on mon Monday's um, check or Monday's date. But um, in UAN, you have to be aware of the fact that when you post it on Friday, that it's going to reduce your fund cash balances and your, your checking balance immediately. So it'll reduce it on Friday. So be aware of your order of operations there that you, you know, have enough cash for maybe other transactions you might need on that Friday. Maybe not the best example, but you get the idea. So um, one other last point, when using a PO regular type purchase order um, for a payment, we talked about this in the purchase order section, the remaining available balance of each appropriation account on a PO regular only can be overspent by up to 5% of its original balance on the purchase order. Um, you must have an unencumbered available balance to do this. Well, um, well, we have an exercise on this, so we'll talk about it when we get, when we get there. And then the import purchase order feature, um, you can import existing purchase orders for use on a payment. All right, so let's take a look at our first guided exercise. We want to make a payment for that capital project. Well, remember the Buckeye Township story? In 2010, we had a, a sewer replacement project. And all the work was done as of 2010, but we had one, we were waiting for the invoice, and one final payment to come in January. And we need to make that a large payment of, I think, $250,000, $250, something like that. And so we have that carryover purchase order from the prior year um, that uh, we need to make a payment on out of that fund. And that's the last one for that fund for that uh, project. All right, so exercise one, we're going to make a payment out to the sewer, sewer guys. So we'll click to our software. And uh, here in payments, we want to add a warrant. And we're on page 56. So I'm going to select the warrant type. So this will print. It'll print a check, and this opens up the add payment form. And we can see at the top here that we have to choose a vendor. This is a required field. So just like with a purchase order, you have to choose your vendor. You have to have a vent existing vendor. So we're going to select the um, the sewer guys right there. And as you can see, we've got our location. We could even that we could change it in the purchase orders. We could, if we had two locations, we could change um, 
it's a, a different from the store location to the office location. And you know that'll print on our in our records and on this um, warrant stub or on the warrant itself. Then we have our date. Well, we only have one date for payments, and that's the post date. So this is again, this is the date that you could forward date or back date. Well, we're going to leave this today's date. Actually, for a warrant payment type, you cannot back date. Um, it'll give you an error message, but for a um, you you could potentially forward date this. All right, there's that import purchase order button. Well, we're going to deal with that in exercise number two, so I'll show you how that works. But um, let's say we choose not to use that this time. Notice we have two tabs, the detail and distribution, and then additional. Well, additional, not much there. It's just an optional field. You can enter in as much detail here on a long description of the purpose of this check. And that'll be on your reports. So back to detail and distribution, where we got our detail section and our distribution. We kind of saw this with the purchase order, right? You saw this kind of uh, screen before. So from page 66, we're going to say we have a quantity of one. That's a required field. So type in the quantity. We can include some more description on the unit name if we want to. Type in some other um, number related to this. but. Uh, We'll skip that for now and include a description of this. And this is a uh, <coughs> a warrant for the sewer pro sewer project payment. Press tab key, and then we put in our unit price, and that's going to be for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So that's our last payment. Okay, and then we press the tab key, and that's our extended price, so the quantity times unit price is our extended price. It works the same way as we saw with the purchase order. You type in a 2 for quantity, press the tab key, it's going to multiply it to 500,000. Well, we really want that. We don't want that in this case, so we'll type in 1. We're back at 250,000. We have the optional. We, you can't include an invoice number in this uh, field as well. But we'll leave that blank for now and insert that into our list of descriptions and that's all we're going to do for this description. Then we'll go to distri distribution. So we have $250,000 we have to distri distribute to different account codes. So we'll click our type first. We'll, we'll type what is the POBC or a um, direct charge. Well this is driven by the vendor if you when you select the vendor if you have if you don't have an open purchase order then the type won't be available blanket certificates uh, if you, you could have a blanket certificate that does not specify a vendor which we do have a couple of those and potentially I could use that but we can see well we only have a thousand dollars in each of those and that doesn't make sense for us if this um, if we could use a direct charge account for this there's our list of direct charges. But that doesn't work for us either in this case. Actually we do have a purchase order open for the sewer guys. So I'll select PO and I can see that the number is by year it's uh, 1 2010. So this is a, a carryover purchase order um, for the sewer guys. So I'll select that and you can see that that's got an estimated unspent balance of $300,000. Out of, with uh, this one account code. So I'll select that and it fills in the account code. If there were any other account codes available on this purchase order, I could, it would list those. This one, particular one only has one account code. It's capital outlay and it fills in my amount to distribute. Now maybe I had two account codes so I could change this to 200,000 and then go and add another one, etc. But in fact, in our situation, as I said, it's 250, or all of it's going to be distributed here. So I'll include include that, or add that to my list, uh, distribution list. 
And now I've filled out all of my required fields, got everything, all of my money distri distributed. Again, remember that remembers dates form. If I fill in that checkbox, this will not clear out when I save this. And remember again for cash transactions, I've got the save button here. That means I'm saving this to batch. It's temporary. So I click on save. Um, I retain my date, 9-1. And I can go on with another payment to a different company or just or another payment to the same company if I wanted to. But I'm going to close this form. And we can see here that I have a warrant type payment in batch to the sewer guys. It's in batch, so I could select it and delete it. I can make edits to it, change it all around, and display it, or I could go and post and print that. But I'm going to wait until I get my other um, payments in batch before I go to, before I post it this time. And that's just the, my choice. So I'll turn to page 57, and we're going to add a payment using the import PO function that we've been kind of glossing over each time. Um, and if you look at that page, this has to do with our ongoing UAN uh, situation here with uh, the Hayes Bequest Fund. We're going to make a payment of $100 out of, for that Buckeye tree um, that we ordered for Woody Hayes Grave. So remember we already added a purchase order in the current year for this of $100. That purchase order is still out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, now's the time to make a payment. And I want to note for exercise two and three, we're going to, it's not, I don't think it's probably realistic, but we're going to show you how to use the other um, payment types. So for this one, you probably would print a warrant, a regular warrant payment. But I'm going to change it so you can see an example of each type. So again, not necessarily realistic, but I'll select the add manual warrant. So this is if we hand wrote a warrant for um, warrant for a hundred and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a hundred dollars. So it says, please note the next available warrant number is ten thousand four. If the manual payment number you entered is greater than ten thousand four, any skipped warrant numbers will be voided when the manual payment is posted. So it's basically saying you got to tell the software what the warrant number is. And if you advance it past this warrant number, that, that's what the last warrant number printed um, you know, before we started class here today, that printed, um, then if you advance it to like 10,011, well, it's going to skip and void every warrant number or just mark it as a misprinted check or voided warrant number between 1,005 and 1,013 what number is 1011 so any number in between the range that you input here will be voided so I'll click OK for this and notice there's my number so since I'm gonna and write that down I'm gonna just type that in first it's a manual type and I have to input the warrant number because UN is not going to print one so 10,000 so that would be 10,004 is that right Okay, so I actually want, that's the next one in line, so I'll leave it at 10,004. I'll select my date as today's date. Or you could say, yeah, I wrote this check yesterday, so I'll date it on the 31st and backdate it. And then this was out to the, uh, this went out to the, actually I don't want to do this because my purchase order was today's date, so we don't want to say we made the payment before it was authorized we need it then and now. So I'll make it today's date. And then the vendor is um, the garden store. Select garden store. And so now I could do this the same way, I, the detail and distribution the same way that I did the other one. I could select a PO. If you select PO you can see that we have this um, purchase order out there for, for 2011 to the garden store with an estimated unspent balance of $100. And I could use that. I could go through the, the motions again. But 
this can, and you know, it's not that much work really. It's only one account code. But what if you have multiple account codes and a lot of descriptions in the detail here? Well, that this can save you a lot of time by using this import purchase order button. And what that does is it'll open up a screen when I click on it. So you can see the add payment in the background. And it allows you to basically copy over your purchase order information into this payment. It doesn't actually change the purchase order. You're not adjusting it. Purchase, you're just basically copying what you inputted before. So first I have to select the type. Now notice that um, it shows um, all of my purchase order types. And this is a PO regular. That will narrow it down. And then I'll select the... Um, the, the purchase order number. Now the reason it's it really narrowed down the list because I had selected a vendor. So let me close this. Close imported selected selections. Now maybe it's a little bit too late to show you that now. I'll have to jump back because I already went to it. Yeah it's not going to allow me to do that. But if you do not if you did not select a vendor already um, then you would have, you would see all of your purchase orders on the screen before you copied it over. So I might have a chance to give you another example of this. We know this is a PO regular. I could select supers and if I had any there or VCs, no vendor specified, I could choose those. But I do have a PO regular open for the garden store. There's a little note next to this, the question mark. Um, so that I, I'll let you read that over. But um, so here's my purchase order that I want to use. I could have multiple ones for this vendor, but I only have one. And it, so it included all the information for my purchase order. To copy it over, you select the checkbox next to it. Now maybe I have multiple account codes. Well, I I don't have to select all of them. I just select the ones that I want to copy. I can also include the garden store location or information like that or the purpose if I had a purpose in the original purchase order inputted. But I'll just leave it at this. So I'm going to copy the detail and distribution over and then I click on the import button. And as you can see it just filled in those amounts for me in the payment. Now maybe when I made that purchase order I thought it's going to be $100 but I had a discount of, um, you know, $5 on that, uh, early bird discount or something. Well, then I could change that to $95. And I could make all those changes within here, the screen here. Notice that I cannot change this information because this is based on the purchase order I selected. I would have to, if I want a different purchase order, I would have to click this little X here and get rid of the information and, and start over. I still have the option to say, okay, this is um, so this is not a hundred dollars. Maybe I want to pay ninety-five out of using this purchase order and use the rest, charge the rest to a blanket certificate. It doesn't specify a vendor or some other PO. I could do that and you know it at this point, all I've done is copy over information from the PO. I'm going to change this back to 100. And so there's nothing really different about the screen besides this number because it's a manual payment and the fact that it imported the purchase order information, copied it over. The one other thing that is different is notice the post button. It's not a save button. It's a post button. And that's because and so this does not go into batch. Uh, and the reason, and it makes sense because notice I've got some other warrants in batch. And if I were to post these all together, well, you know, it's going to screw some things up because I inputted the warrant number here already. So, you know, you've got to po post one manual payment at a time. And that's intentional. That, mean, that helps you to regulate, okay, which number is this handwritten payment what, what, was, what check was it made out to? So it allows, gives you that control. 
So I'm going to click on the post button and notice it gives me a confirmation posted one item. If I look at my, if you notice that that estimated primary decreased by $100 here from $8.50 to $7.50. And that's it. Um, I know you can't see this, but it's nothing printed to my printer. Nothing would print to my printer. It just recorded that number as 10,004. The next no warrant number it will print to, if I print this one next, would be 10,005. So that's how you post a manual warrant. All right, so let's look at exercise number three on page 58. And we're going to add a payment and overspend PO by 5%. And we're also going to record this as an electronic payment just to show you how electronic payment works. So I'll click on Add, Electronic. And then I'll specify my vendor. Now, if I, well, let me show you this. If I don't specify the vendor, I just click on Import Purchase Order. Then I've got, if I look here, if I don't specify the type, then I've got all of my purchase orders and blanket certificates available to use. If I click, for instance, the sewer guys here, I'll go ahead and cancel this by clicking, well, maybe the company, $50, and import it. Well, I might have a problem. Okay. I've got to select the checkbox. I forgot to do that. Click on import. It imports it, but then it fills in the vendor for me. So I can't use I can't use this purchase order for some other vendor. It was made out to the company, and I got to use it for the company. So I'm going to start over because I don't really want to make a payment to the company. Say no. Now click on add electronic again. So we see here it's electronic payment. I'm going to specify the company. It is. Um, buy a lot stores and then I'll, our date is going to be um, today's date and then we can choose the location so this one has three different locations um, so I'll choose um, Oxley Avenue so if you have more than one vac vac location well, it's not a required field for the payment, but if you want to fill it out, be aware of the fact that if you have more than one, you have to select the drop-down menu and choose which one of those payments. Notice also that one of these payments is probably deactivated because I have location one, two, one, three, and four. Oh, I like the fact that it, my contact name is a guy person for at all of them. That's interesting. All right, so I could import the purchase order. It's actually purchase order um, 3, 2011. So I click on import. Click on the PO, 3, 2011. Buy a lot stores. And as we can see here, it's got a $900. We have a $900 purchase order open with an estimated unspent balance of $900. So I'm going to select that and import it, so copies it over, but this payment is for um, this payment is for nine hundred and twenty five dollars. So I'm going to change the price to nine twenty five. Now again I'm not changing my purchase order, it's just, I'm just changing this payment. It just copied the information. So you can't you're not getting around the purchase order authorization, you're just changing the payment option. Remember that 5% rule. This is a PO oh <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah this is a this is a, a PO regular. POO. And so we'll change that to 925. I'll charge this account code. And then save it to batch. It's electronic, save to batch. If I close that I can see I've got a warrant saved to batch, an electronic payment saved to batch. So again, if I look at my P, if I go to accounting reports and look at um, well, 
purchase order reports, look at the detail of this, or the PO status, one of our key reports there, and look at the uh, buy lot stores. I can see that this was opened and the amount available is just 900 so my importing had no impact on the purchase order itself. All right, so now I'm ready to um, ready to post this purchase or post these payments and then we'll look at some reports. So I go select the payments I want to post and I click on post print posting two selected items. Um, is that okay? Yes, okay. And the uh, it tells me the next, remember I said the next warrant, we, we posted a manual warrant to 10,004 and so now it's advancing to, it's going to tell me the next warrant on my list is going to be 10,005. So I got to make sure that I load my printer, take it, I don't want the, this to print to just regular old plain white paper. I want to put in my warrant paper and load it, make sure one that 10,005 is the next one in line. Now what happens if let's say, well you're a coffee drinker like me and you get your warrants out and oops, I spilled my coffee all over warrant number 1,005. Well you don't have to worry, that's why we have this built into the software, this use selected warrant number. <laughs> I can skip that warrant number, I can't lower this warrant number Remember back in the checking account maintenance, that's where we can lower the warrant number, you know, if in the case of where you change banks or maybe during your conversion process, you might change the warrant number there. But in the checking maintenance, you can't, you can't increase the warrant number, and here you can. So you can skip the warrant number. Now by default, we're not going to skip any warrant numbers, it's zero. But let's say I damage a couple of my checks. They're useless. Uh, maybe I printed a report on my warrant. That's another common thing that happens. Well, I can change this to, let's say, 1007. And it'll show me that it's going to skip two warrants. I click OK. It says two warrant numbers, one, 105 and 106, will be skipped and marked as void. Do you want to continue? Hey, look out. Um, well, yes, I do, because they were wasted. So I'll click OK. And then it brings up the print utility and it says um, you can, you're going to print one accounting warrant. Well, you can't print more than one copy of that. It's grayed out. It's a, you know, an official warrant document. So load warrant numbers 1007 through 1007. If I had a bunch of, if I maybe had 10 warrants that I was printing all at once, then it would give me an entire range there. I would load those into my printer and then click on the print button. And now I'll pretend like they're actually printing out. Let's go into my printer. I don't have my printer turned on, so nothing's actually printing for class. But then I get another print utility for the electronic payment. These items have been selected. Um, to put, these items have been posted successfully. So they posted. These auto, will automatically post, so did the warrant. But did it print OK? And or make sure you load your regular paper. So you kind of have to be careful when you're printing electronic, when you're posting electronic and warrants at the same time, because you could end up, if I wasn't careful here, I could end up printing um, just this electronic voucher, a non-negotiable document, onto my warrant paper. And I don't want to do that. I'll end up wasting some more warrants. <coughs> so to be honest with you, for, for me, I would probably post the electronics and the warrants separately. Um, that'll make it easier on you. So it bring, that's one of the reasons it brings up the separate utility. So you have a chance to stop, say, okay, it's electronic payment. I'm going to load up, take out my warrants, put in the plain white paper. And notice here I can print multiple copies because it's a non-negotiable voucher. It's just going to show me that, hey, I paid this online. Here's a record that they, the accounts were charged properly. So I'll click print and it'll print out a regular payment for me, or I mean electronic payment. Now everything posted, this posted two items and so it decreased my cash balance. I can see here that it decreased my cash balance. 
I forget what the total was, but it, it did hit cash immediately. Um, do, did they print successfully? Well, if not, then you can reprint or reissue depending on what type it was. For a, when I click on no, it opens up my payment utility, and here this um, electronic payment for Biolite stores, I could reprint that if I wanted to. For the warrants, I can't reprint a warrant, but I can reissue it. I can void it and reprint another warrant number. So anyways, we'll talk about that in utilities a little bit later. But now we can see that it's out of batch, and it's nothing in batch now, and it's, everything is hit cash. Um, this little button at the bottom you may have noticed, I'm going to discuss this when we go, we talk about our general maintenance setup. It relates to, well, I'll, I'll discuss it later, but it's, um, it's kind of a minor little feature we have built into the software. All right, so we've posted our payments. If we go look at a few of our key reports here, we can look now at, um, I might have to refresh the screen here, but if I go back to my PO status, I can see that now I've got that um, purchase, well, here's my purchase order for the garden store and for buy a lot stores. If I select both of those and display them, and I think I had one, see, and to the sewer guy, so I might as, might as well display that as well. So the PO status, well, it shows you your issue date and your transaction date. Remember, those two dates can be different. This is the date that I click the post print button, and this is the date that uh, on the well the post button for the post for the purchase order. This is the date of the um, the issue date that I keyed in. So each of these. I've got the, the vendor, et cetera, the account codes. What I want to look at here is the amounts. So for the sewer project, I encumbered $300,000 last year. I charged or made a payment for $250,000. That was one example. We still have an available balance for possibly another payment of $50,000. Under um, the amount, so that's the amount encumbered on the purchase order. Here for the, this is the, that amount that I overspent, the buy a lot stores, that was our last example. I had a $900 encumbered on that purchase order. I charged more than that. Well, $925 is, um, the $25 extra is uh, within the 5% range. This is a purchase order regular. So within the 5% range, so I'm okay. It lets me do that. And so it showed, but it shows me the amount overspent of $25. Now, I want to point out this point that, yes, the um, Ohio Revised Code allows you to do this for PO regulars, but your audit, the intent of that is you're not really supposed to do that all the time. It's meant as a, um, as a provision for cases such, for, you know, different circumstances where it's just a little bit more than what you expected, maybe because of like shipping and handling fees. Um, you know, and sometimes the estimates for those those amounts change. And so maybe you've got a PO open for 900 and it ends up being a lot more shipping and handling than you expected. Well, then you've got that a little extra wiggle room for the PO regulars. Doesn't apply to blanket certificates or super blanket certificates. Only the PO regulars and PO then and nows. Um, and if I try to post a payment here for, um, let's say if it was, instead of 925, it was 950, I would not be able to do that. It would stop me because the limit is 5%, and 5% of 900 is $45. So 945 would be the max. It would allow me to overspend this. All right, and then the last one was the... Uh, garden store that PO had open for $100 and I can see that I had, it was encumbered 100 charged 100 and then um, yeah and it was encumbered charged 100 and on this one as well as this one I have an available balance of zero I've already spent 
the um, entire amount of that, that purchase order. If we look at another key report, the appropriation status, as we've seen before, and if I look at, let's see, for the garden store, it was that property services, account code, and for buy lot, it was uh, 1,110, 410. So if I look at those two, display that to the screen. Actually, even better. I really should select all of them. Let's see for. Forty three oh one, okay. Seven sixty seven hundred. Sorry about that. So I display all three of those related those accounts related to our payments in the appropriation status. Well they're different funds, so they're listed separately. But we can see for the um, see the office supplies, that was for the buy a lot stores. There's the 925 in expenditures. Now, this is a little different. That was for my purchase order. It doesn't really tell me everything here because the current reserve for encumbrances, I had an appropriation of $2,000. I, I encumbered $1,000, and then I had 925 in expenditures. Well, I must have had a $900 purchase order open and then another $100 blanket or purchase order open for this. But I do have an unencumbered balance left of $75. If I look at the sewer replacement project, well, that, that was a carryover reserve for encumbrance from the prior year, $300,000. My current reserve for encumbrance for the current year, so apparently I have a, a, a budget amount of $50,000. And oh, I'm sorry, no. My reserve for encumbrance that carried over was $300,000. And then the current reserve for encumbrance, what's left, I have no appropriations in this year. It's zero. So that's still my carryover, part of my carryover encumbrance. And the, before, these two equaled. Now this has been reduced. And I've got year-to-date expenditures of $250,000. And then finally, that garden store payment, or I'm sorry, the Hayes Bequest payment to the garden store I had appropriations of 300. This is the one one we looked at before. Appropriations of 300 for this year. Um, my current reserve for encumbrance is zero. It reduced that amount because I no longer have a balance on my purchase order. My year-to-date expenditures is $100, <coughs> and I've got an unencumbered balance in this account code of $200. So if I want to make any more payments um, on this appropriations, that $200, I would have to open up some other purchase order or blank certificate to do so. All right, so that gives you an idea of how all this posts to cash and how it affects your reports. Okay, I think that's everything that uh, I wanted to... Uh, discuss uh, regarding payments. Our next chapter is on interfund transfers. We've only got a few more transactions to go over before we get to the utilities section.